Hello everyone, this is Rabbi Ari Sachs of Congregation Beth Mordechai uh, from Perth Amboy, New Jersey, here to welcome you again to another edition of this week's online Parsha class, Parshat Korach. Uh, but before we begin, um, I wanted to just um, extend um, uh, my hopes and my prayers uh, to the families of the three Israeli teens who are um, have been kidnapped in Israel that uh, we are all praying for their return and that the learning for today is done in their honor um, and in order to share some of the light of Torah to help all those who are engaged in the efforts to bring them home safely. Um, and so with that in mind, we're going to turn to today's teaching, which also relates uh, to this pressing issue at hand in the Jewish world. Uh, so the today's Torah portion of Parshat Korach uh, is a very famous Torah portion in that it tells a story of a rebellion against Moses. Korah, who is a Levite, um, based, a member of the, these, this priestly um, these servants of the, of the temple, basically comes to Moses and says, why you? Why are you our leader? Why are, do you take all the power for yourself? Why don't you allow others to become involved, and specifically him, uh, Korah, and some of his followers? And so they rise up against Moses, and we learn a little bit later on of how God strikes them down, but it's actually in the midst of one of his arguments that I want to start our conversation about what exactly is it, what, what exactly is the argument that, um, that Korach undertakes in regards to, under, in regards to um, making the claim that Moses has lost the favor of all the peoples that he has actually led them astray in their wanderings, and so we're going to turn in just a moment to our to our Torah portion, which is um, from beginning in, in, in Numbers chapter 16. I'm going to look at uh, Safaria.org for this one particular line. So, prior to this, Korach has, uh, sh has shared some of his uh, complaints against Moses in terms of uh, why are you greater than all the other Levites who also uh, seek um, coming close to God and why should you necessarily be the leaders and why is it you and Aaron have taken control. And then he says that one of the reasons why Moses should step down Is from this verse 13. Hamaat ki he'elitanu me'eretz davat chalav udavash lahamitenu bamidbar ki tistarer alenu gam histarer. Is it a small thing that you shall t that you shall rise us up from a land flowing with milk and honey, so that we will die in the wilderness? That you shall that you shall rule over us and also that you shall be a prince over us. So there's two different elements of this particular verse. I'm only going to deal with one of them, but I'll just refer to the other first. Uh, that the other element is this repetition of the term tistarer, of that which he shall rule over them. And the rabbis love to focus on repetition of verses, and so some uh, refer to it as speaking about um, Moses and Aaron, that why is it that Moses is over us and why is it also that Aaron is over us because it does seem that one of the complaints is not necessarily just against Moses but also the fact that Moses has appointed his brother Aaron to rule over the people as well. So that um, the sense that it's not just of what Moses and, Moses and Aaron did but it's the fact that they continue to rule over the people. But what is it that Moses and Aaron did so egregiously? It's that line that that they brought up the Israelites me'eret zavat chalav udavash from a land flowing with milk and honey. That that phrase eret zavat chalav udavash should sound very familiar. 
it appears in our previous Torah portion in Parashat Shalach Lecha, when the spies go out to, to spy on the land of Israel, and they report back, one of the good, the good parts of their reports is that it is a land flowing with milk and honey. And it seems that is both from that context and from other contexts as well, that we learn that Israel is considered to be, the land of Israel is considered to be so bountiful, so full of God's, um, uh, of, of God's gifts, that it is considered to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And it is also out of that particular context that seems to lead to an assumption which I think uh, pervades the not only just the Jewish world now, but even in the Judeo-Christian uh, context, that Israel is the land of milk and honey. So as opposed to land of milk and honey being a description of a land, you know, it's the same thing as saying that it is a land with mountains that are so high. Well, there aren't there aren't just isn't just one country with mountains that are so high. There are many particular lands, and in fact, that seems to be the context of what Korach is referring to. Because in addition to this one line where he says that you brought us up from this land of Egypt, which is a land of milk and honey, he says in the very next line. Af lo el eretz zavat chalavu duvashaviyotanu, that that even if you decide to uh, bring us um, out, if you even if you bring us to a land of milk and honey, that we should still uh, be that that we should still rise up against you because of all the things that you've done to us. In other words, that Korach is referring to. Egypt as a land of milk and honey and says that maybe Israel is a land of milk and honey. Therefore, he's using it in the descriptive con in a descriptive context. Yet the rabbis have a, a, an issue with it. The issue being that Israel is considered to be the land of milk and honey in the eyes of the rabbis. And so in order to understand how is it possible for Korach to use this description, to this phrase to use to describe Egypt, the place in which the Israelites were slaves, that the rabbis have to understand a little bit more of what maybe Korach is trying to get at. Um, and in fact, I'll say that when I was first reading this particular verse in preparation for today, it was that line that Egypt is a land of milk and honey that really struck me, that really arrested my attention to think, how is it possible that Egypt could be this land of milk and honey? So in order to understand that, we're going to turn to um, in, uh, uh, a rabbi by the name of, um, who, who goes by the title of um, Panim Yafot. Uh, his name is Rabbi Pinchas Halevi Horowitz, who is a rabbi from the 18th century in born in Poland and then mostly worked in Prussia. He's a Hasidic rabbi um, who he's a Hasidic rabbi who um, is was one of the leader is one of the mentors for uh, one of the most famous Hasidic rabbis known as the Khatam Sofer. And to get a little bit of the background context for for what Rabbi Pinchas Levi is about to say, that there is a tradition that when Israel, when the Israelites were brought out of the land of Egypt, that there was a mountain that hung over them, and God basically said, unless you accept my Torah, that this space will become your graves, i.e., that I will drop this mountain upon you unless you accept the Torah. In which case, the Israelites were anusim, that they were forced, that they were obliged to accept the Torah for fear of death. And the question that comes from this tradition is, did the Israelites truly receive the Torah out of their own free will, out of their own desire to accept it? And in fact, another tradition from, another teaching from uh, the Talmud says that it was on the, it was at this moment a revelation that the Israelites fully accepted, sorry, that they were forced to receive the Torah, and it wasn't until Purim, until much later on, after in the days of King Ahasuerus, that we read at the very end of the book of Megillah Esther, that the Israelites fully accepted the Torah for themselves. 
so that there is this period of time in which the Israelites were forced to receive the Torah. And in fact, that by being forced to receive the Torah, that this act was not for their own benefit. That this act was done to potentially harm them. Or that that could be how the Israelites might perceive of this issue. And with that as a background, um, we're going, now going to turn to the teaching from Rabbi Pinchas Levi Horowitz. And it's the second comment here. Omnam hayoter nir e, de'en shum savra lichfor batova. Indeed, it is more likely that there is no reason to deny the goodness of coming out of Egypt to receive the Torah. That the Panim Yafot is saying that, in fact, it is good that, is, that, the, that, the, that they were forced to be able to have to accept the Torah because, as he mentions in a previous comment, that it is the very fact that they were slaves in the land of Egypt that meant that even though they were forced to receive the Torah under the fear of this mountain dropping up on top of them, that it was better than their lives would have been in the land of Egypt. Therefore, because they were slaves, it doesn't seem to be a bad thing at all to be forced to accept the Torah. However, And the Panim Yafot is saying that there is no reason to accept this argument that it was bad that the, that the, that, um, that the Israelites came out of Egypt, sorry, that they came out of Egypt and received the Torah and they were forced to do so. But in in so far as they did that, that this leaving of Egypt, which should be seen in the light the fact that it was done out of out of slavery, that what Korach is trying to do in his comment is to say that they were raised out of Egypt, that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Vehu sheker mefursam, and that this is a great lie. And so what he's basically saying here is that insofar as Korach wanted to use that tradition that they that the Israelites were being forced by this mountain to accept the Torah he was making the argument that Israel that the Israelites were forced to leave a land that was already good and therefore, there was no reason to come out into the desert and to be forced to accept this Torah when they were already having a good life. And so that's why he used this term Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash to, in, another, in order to be able to say that this a concept of accepting Torah is one that is going to be caught, that is going to make our lives worse than the lives in which we led, led in Egypt, which was already a good life. And what the Panim Yafot is about to say is that it is not true that Israel, that Egypt is a land flowing with milk and honey, but rather that there is only one land flowing with milk and honey. Vehu sheker mefursam, because it is a great lie, Ki ein zavat chalav udvash ella be'eretz Yisrael, because there is no land of milk and honey other than the land of Israel, meaning that Egypt was necessarily a bad place for the Israelites to be, and therefore even being forced to receive the Torah was a good thing for them, and that the only land that is a this beautiful land flowing milk and honey is the land of Israel. And how does he know this? V'chein perush Rashi, v'perek b'reshit mem gimel yud And as Rashi teaches us in Genesis 30, 43, verse 11, 
ukechu mizimrata aretz vegomer, and that they took from the praises of the land, me'at sori, a little bit of balm, me'at devash, and a little bit of honey, and that what this is referring to, shehi shevach eretz Israel, that this kind of uh, produce from the land of Israel, that it is, that these are the praises of the land of Israel. Now, what he's, what the Panim Yafot is, is using here is this teaching from Gen, from Rashi based upon this verse in Genesis about how produce coming from the land of Israel is considered to be the proof text that it is a land flowing of milk and honey. But in order to better understand Rashi, I actually do want to go into the context of uh, of this comment and go back to and go back to Genesis to understand further what the Panim Yafot is referring to in Rashi's comment. And so, we're now going to turn to. Genesis chapter 43 and the very first line very important this is the this is the second time in which um, the in which Jake um, Jacob's sons or Israel's sons are deciding to go to the land of Egypt to get food kaved ba'aretz, and the famine was sore in the land now the very fact that you have a famine in the land of Israel, that the land of Israel is bereft of food, should stand in stark contrast to the idea that it is a land flowing with milk and honey. How could a land that is so plentiful have no food in it that would force the that would force Jacob to send his sons to go get food from the land, to go get food from Egypt? Now, in the first time that that Jacob makes his command to have his sons. Simply, they just go out. They just go and they and they decide to go straight up to Egypt to get the food. Here, it's a little bit different. We go down to verse eleven. Vayomer alehem Yisrael avihem, and their father Israel said to them, Imken efo zot asu. So, if it be so, now do this. Meaning, when you go up to the land of it, with land of of Canaan, kehu mezimrat haaretz. Take from the uh, the the praises of this land, or the translation here is the choice fruits of the land. But the word zemer, zayin mem reish, literally means to praise, or as if a song. So that when you sing at the end of a meal, then you're singing um, you're singing zimriot. Ha Kehu mizimrata aretz bichlechem in your uh, vessels. Vehoridu leish mincha meat sori umeat devash. Bring a little bit of balm and a little and a little bit of honey. Nechot valot botnim ushkedim and some spicery and ladanum and nuts and almonds and all these wonderful things. So in this second time that 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 Jacob is sending the sons to be able to go out to the land of milk to to Egypt to go get food he's sending food with them he's sending choice fruits of the land doesn't that seem a little bit off doesn't it seem a little bit weird that then the land that is full of a famine that you have these this um, these other fruits, these other foods that are already there and that are good enough to be used as gifts to the land in which you want to take food from them. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect. Why would you go and get food if you already seem to have some food? And that's where Rashi comes in to help us understand the purpose of this comment in regards to what the deal is with these fruits that the Israel that Jacob's sons are bringing up to, are bringing up to, um, to Egypt. Mizimrata aretz from the praises of the land or from the choices choice fruits of the land, miturgam as it's as it's taught in the translation known as a turgam, midem shevach be'arah. 
from the praised produce of the land, shehakol mezamrim alav, that all of these praise, this all this praise produce praises the land of Israel, keshehu bale olam, when it comes into the world. In other words, that the purpose of this phrase, the purpose of this teaching by Rashi, which I'll bring up here because I realized I just did not share that, that these mizimrata aretz, that these uh, praises of the land, that it is the praised produce of the land, that it is used in order to be able to say that this land is particularly beautiful. In other words, that the purpose of the produce of Israel is more than simply about having good food. It is more than simply about the fact that um, that the that there is um, that there is food available for the for Jacob and for his family to eat in case that they're hungry. In fact, there seems to be lacking a lot of the food that they would need. Rather, the purpose of mentioning all of these praiseworthy foods is because it is in the foods that exist on the land that speak to the specialness of the land. In other words, Panim Yafot is using Rashi here to explain that when we talk about the fruits of the land of Israel, we're not just talking about good fruit that's there to eat but a fruit that is so special that it speaks to the specialness of that particular land in its own particular in its own context so that when we think about Israel leaving Egypt to go to the land of Israel we're not talking about leaving this one place that had food for another place that has food or that has milk and honey but rather we're talking about leaving from this place that was simply just a place to this home which is even more special which is even more unique, that has this, this kind of aura that even the produce seems to utter praises to the beautiful land that is there. And I think that this is so important for us in thinking about how Israel relates to the Jewish world as a whole. Meaning that when it comes to all different kinds of events that happen in the land of Israel, all the different produce that's created by the land of Israel, that there is something special about Israel that seems to be a little bit different than all of the great produce that is that exists in the rest of the Jewish world or in the rest of the world in general. Meaning that if you do two of the same, if you do two things, one in Israel and one in let's say in America, and I'm talking about in the Jewish world, one thing in the Jewish world in Israel, one thing in the Jewish world in Israel, one thing in the, one thing in the Jewish world in Israel, one thing in the Jewish world, say, in America, that there seems to be more attention given to what happens in Israel because there's something about being in the land of Israel that is so unique than any other potential land. And that goes also when it comes to any particular event that is troubling that happens in the land of Israel and speaking particularly about the three teens who have been kidnapped that why is this event so much worse so much uh, says led to so many rallies that happened throughout the Jewish world whether in Israel and America and France and in Australia as it's happened what what is so different about the fact that you have this event than other anti-semitic or any other um, horrible event that has happened to the Jewish people. And perhaps it is that when our attention is, when something happens in Israel, that there is this unique pull that we have. That Sorry, that there is this unique pull that Israel has upon us that it can't, we can't let go of. It doesn't mean that what happens in America, what happens in other places in the world, aren't important. And in fact, what I'm going to be talking about tonight in our um, uh, during services is a little bit about 
um, the differences now between Israel and America and how the pull may not be as strong as it used to be and the, and the consequences of that. Yet there still seems to be that sense of Eretz Avat, Chalav Duvash, El Rak Be Eretz Yisrael, that there's only in the land of Israel are the produce that much more praiseworthy. And as such, we turn our attention to Israel even more than maybe we would think that we normally would because that there is such that that there is such attention captured by this whether it's a mystical feeling whether it's um, just with the historical element of what Israel means to the Jewish people that there is this pull that is different than any other land that Israel has upon us and so as we enter into the Shabbat of Korach, the Shabbat in which we hear about the rebellion that we should not be going to the land of Israel because we're already fine where we are, to realize that the specialness of Israel, both in its good days and in its bad days, arrests our attention and makes us keep in mind the events that go on there to know that those events are part of us no matter where we are, no matter where we live. And such, I want to thank you for joining me for today's online Parsha class, and we'll see you again next week. Take care and all the best. Bye-bye.